put into that. So without further ado, Jen Ellis and her mystery guest will uh, make you better. Thanks very much. No clapping? <laughs> they were stunned by what you said. <laughs> they were wondering how much I paid you to say it. Uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Can you guys actually hear me? I don't know if the mic is picking up. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Perfect. All right. Um, so yes, as Josh mentioned, I'm going to have a special guest with me, a real-life reporter. Ooh. <laughs> um, so the agenda is, uh, since this is hacking the media for fame and profit, uh, the agenda is um, hackery-type things. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about how you get a foot in the door, infiltration, we're going to talk about uh, once you're there what you do, uh, exploitation, um, and then we're going to talk about how you uh, continue afterwards to uh, basically create more opportunity for yourself. And then if there's time, we're going to do some Q&A and maybe some practice. Um, why am I doing this? Uh, so as Josh just mentioned, one of the things that um, I sort of believe in a, in a very core way, and, and as Josh mentioned, I'm not at all technical, um, but I work with a lot of really great researchers. And I think that this, this stuff that we do all day, the stuff that we talk about, the security stuff, is really important. Um, I think it's important in a bigger sense than just our ability to sell things to each other. And I actually think that you know we're at the forefront of um, emerging threats that affect people's safety in their lives in a meaningful way that they don't fully understand. And for us to be able to make a difference we need to not only have the deep sort of technical understanding that many of you have, we need to be able to break that down in a way that is simple and meaningful and impactful for other people. And this is something that is a real challenge for a lot of people to do. It's not straightforward to translate. Um, and so that's why I, I do this kind of stuff. So I'm going to invite Paul up. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> so everybody, Paul Roberts. He's the uh, editor of Security. <laughs> yeah, come on, clap, clap. My name's Paul. <laughs> My name's Paul. I'm a reporter. Been a reporter for 12 years. Hi, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, he's the, the editor of Security Ledger, um, and he contributes to Christian Science Monitor well Passcode. How long have you been a security writer? I've been. A, I picked up the security beat in 2000, uh, September of 2002. Nice. So I yeah. was right when I said 10 plus years. I'm yeah. guessing. Um, okay. So uh, my background real quick is that I'm the head of communications at Rapid7. I'm also part of the core group that works on the cavalry, as Josh mentioned. Um, I work with security researchers across the industry, not just at Rapid7 because of Metasploit. Um, there is a sort of running joke among some of the security press that I am the PR person for the entire security industry, <laughs> um, which is not true. They don't pay me enough for that. Uh, OK, so we'll get started. So. When you are launching your attack, and by the way, there's going to be a lot of like pseudo security language in here. Don't judge me. I'm not a security person. Um, okay. So when you're when you're mounting your attack, um, the important thing to do is um, to begin with some reconnaissance. You need to know your target. So oh, and by the way, I'm also going to call on audience participation a lot in this. So unlucky for those who turned up. Um, so. Can anybody name any of these people other than Paul? There's no prizes for naming Paul. <laughs> Anyone? Yep, Krebs? Yep. Yeah, you don't count. <laughs> you get no prizes for being like, yes, these are my friends. <laughs> uh, any others? So, okay, from um, top left, we have Steve Reagan, who writes for CSO Online. Uh, Andy Greenberg, who writes for Wired. Um, Kelly Jackson Higgins writes for Dark Reading. Paul Wagenstell writes for Tom's Guide. Um, Paul. Uh, Brian Krebs, who writes for himself and the world. Um, Nicole Pelroth, who writes for the New York Times. Samita Rashid, who's a freelancer and writes for a lot well, of... I've never met, I've never met Nicole Pelroth, actually. Uh, neither has anybody. She doesn't really exist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Dan Gooden, who <laughs> writes for Ars Technica and Andrew Peterson, who writes for the Wall Street Journal. And these are a selection of people who write full-time on security. They cover the stuff that you care about every single day. These are people that you should know, or at least know about, if you're interested in getting involved in talking to media. 
And when you think about how to approach them, you want to do your recon in the way that you would when you think about anything else that you're about to undertake. You want to understand you know, how, who's their readership, what's their title like, how technical are they going to be, how long have they covered security, what kind of areas of security do they cover, like, do they have a pro-privacy stance, do they not, like, what are the things that make them unique as a reporter covering this space that you're going to be able to tap into to make them most interested in you. So, with that said, we're going to do a little bit of a what's it like to be a security reporter. And I have a tame one right here. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Paul a bunch of questions about what his average day is like, just to give you a sense of it. So, hi, Paul. Hi, how are you? How do you like being interviewed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay uh, being interviewed, actually. Shoot, it's on the other foot. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, approximately how many emails do you get a day? Um, you mean just pitches or just in general? Yeah, I mean in general. I probably get um, around 400 emails a day. And of the, what percentage of pitches, press releases, et cetera, et cetera? Um, you know, uh, pitches, uh, uh, there's got to be over 150. Right. I mean, you know, either pitch or pitch related, kind of pre-pitch, like, would you be interested in? Or right. here's an expert that we have. I mean, a lot of them are not specific yeah. to me. Responses to some news story, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, right. So PR agencies and in-house PR have been very good about um, picking up on news stories, yeah. you know, hooking in an expert, that's, which is useful to me. I, I use those. I take those and put them in an experts folder and occasionally I, I delve into that folder if I do need to talk to somebody. So of your 400 emails, how many do you realistically read? Um, I like read, 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 read. <laughs> the better question is how many do I not delete just out of hand? I mean, I probably delete 300 or right 250 off. of them just right. right off. Okay. Like read the subject line and just like, no. Um, and then, so that leaves about 150 that I actually go through. Um, some of those might be, you know, automated alerts that I'm using for idea generation. And some of those might be, um, you know, do you want a briefing? Are you interested in this topic? Would you be interested in a story like this? I have my own publication, so we, would you be interested in the, you know, thought leadership or contributed yeah. piece? So some of it's that as well. Um, and we just talked about emails, but how many, like, calls of a similar kind would you get? Not that many phone calls. Not that many phone calls. Um, that, those days are fun. gone, yeah. Um, it's more, um, it, it's almost all email, uh, not as much social media, not as much, like, picking up the phone and calling me. So the first thing that you guys just learned is if you want to get his attention, call him. Or yeah. use social media. Yeah. Don't <laughs> use an email. It, it does work. I mean, it can work. I, I certainly don't want to start getting 300 <laughs> phone calls a day, but... Um, if, if you need to, um, I mean, the problem is with phone calling is it's, it's hard on, it's, it's time consuming on yep. your, your end as well. But if you've got something that you think is, you know, worthy of, of my attention, it could be useful to actually try and talk to me by phone. And okay. I do pick up my phone and I do have conversations with people. So you get, you get all of this in, uh -huh. how many articles are you actually aiming to write per day, week, whatever? So my, my energies and attention, so I'm a little bit different than most of these people, except yep. maybe Mr. Krebs, um, in that I have my own publication. So I'm a one person media and events company, in addition to being a contributor for yep. Christian Science Monitor, in addition to occasionally writing for some of the other industry publications, IT World, Info World, um, Economist, uh, uh, you know, uh, EIU, um, and places like that. So. I am writing every day, um, whether I'm writing for Security Ledger, and I try and do one to two posts a day for Security Ledger, usually more one, but I try and at least do that. Um, and then um, I am blogging for some of my underwriters, like Digital Guardian, so some of my stuff goes there. Uh, and then I'm doing one to two pieces a month for, for Christian Science Monitor. So at a minimum, I'm doing, uh, let's say a minimum, I'm doing six blog posts a week, right. um, or, or articles a week. Um, and then one or two or more feature stories. Um, so it's a little, so when I started, I was a beat reporter for IDG News Service, um, which many of you know, it's just a, a company-wide news service for IDG. It's kind of like a, a news wire, and they populate most of the IDG sites like InfoWorld and CIO and CSO and Network World and PC World with most of their 
most of their news coverage, most of the sort of low-level tech coverage is coming out of the news service. They've got reporters in bureaus all over the world. Um, and so I was their security beat reporter. So then I was doing probably two to three stories a day. Right. Um, of anywhere from 400 to, you know, seven or 800 But words. of this group here? Yeah. Who's doing you that? You probably write more pieces than they do. <clears throat> e yeah, that's probably true. I don't know about Dan. Dan writes a lot, um, but they tend to be longer at Ars Technica. Um, Steve writes a fair amount too. So it's, but it, yeah, I, it is, I, I write he, a lot. He aims to write at one at the most a day. Yeah. So, yeah. so the numbers again are you're looking at like 400 emails down to 150 to get one article. And how right. often does that article idea actually come from an email? Pretty rarely. I mean, I've been covering the beat for like, you know, 13 years. So I, uh, you know, I see, I see stories or I find stories that are interesting to me. Um, and when you've been doing it this long, it's, it's like the end of the matrix where you start to see the ones and the zeros. You know, you start to see the good stories kind of popping out of the matrix and being like, oh, that's, that's new or that's different. Um, and when I was younger, it was more like, oh, you got to write this or you got to write that or we have to respond. And also, you might have pressure. I don't have any editors. So you have pressure from editors to be like, we need a version of this. Second day take or get us, get that story up on our site too because we, we're not going to just repost it from this right. other site. So your core sources are more likely to be things like Twitter or The Wires, AP, something yeah. like that. Yeah, news groups, Twitter, um, uh, you know, yeah, some site that I'm covering and see sort of an interesting Me Too or Second Day take on. So those could all be sources of, imp or just talk, doing an interview with somebody often on an unrelated topic and an okay. idea comes out of that. So there's a certain amount of serendipity involved. Um, I, you know, I would say in the news industry, there's a real, there's a real divide right now between the um, traffic-based sites and the audience-based sites. And I think you see um, a lot of websites whose business model is solely really around display advertising that want just max, max page views, max um, um, hits. And so they'll do listicles and they'll do really quick hit pieces. Sensationalized headlines. Sensationalized headlines. Um, and, um, and then there are sites that are maybe more trying to cultivate an audience and they're going to hopefully do a little bit better job, a little yeah. bit more original reporting. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. So, everybody, give Paul a hand. We're going to hear more from Paul in a bit, okay. but in the meantime, yes. <laughs> thanks. You're welcome. So, the whole point of that was that you, if you want to talk to press, have a lot of competition. And to make yourself interesting and relevant, you have to really think about what you're doing and how you're doing it. You have to, like, put your time and effort in. Um, <clears throat> so, planning your attack. There are two basic types of um, media outreach. There is the proactive, which is where you proactively have something that you want to share. Um, for people who work for a vendor, this is often the kind of stuff that they're focused on. It's their vendor news that they're trying to get out there somewhere. So, you know, a core part of my job at Rapid7 is to try and get people to be interested in our specific news. Um, and then the other side is reactive. So that's, there's a breaking story, like today there's a story about a, um, an Indian social media company that's been hacked. Um, and so you see the story break, like I saw that story on Twitter this morning at seven, sent it to our PR team, and they put out a, a comment so that if somebody like Paul has seen that story and is planning on writing, we go to the reporters we think are most likely to write about it and we offer them some sort of commentary on it to include in their piece. Because when a reporter is writing an article, they can't have the whole thing just be their words. They need to have it be from other people. And that doesn't mean that they need something super controversial or earth shattering, but they need to be able to explain the story in the simplest terms and the biggest impact for readers with other people like third parties who have credibility in the space to talk about it. So those are the two different types of outreach you're going to do, and you have to think about them completely differently. If you're doing the reactive side, you have a very small window in which to engage. Um, your average reporter will look at the news stories first thing in the morning. They'll have decided by about 9 or 10 a.m. what their story is going to be, and they'll aim to have it written and filed by noon. So if you are looking at it in the afternoon, don't bother. Like You've totally missed your window for that. Um, if you want to get in, you have to try and get in before 10 a.m., basically, is what you're looking at. 
Whereas if you are looking at pitching your own news, the way to do it is to build in a much longer timeline for yourself. You want to try and give your core press, the people that you really, really, really want to cover it, you want to give them a heads up in advance. Press who focus in the security space will respect an embargo. If you go to them and you say clearly, we have an announcement coming up, we would like to work with you on this, would you be interested in hearing about it in advance under embargo, they will agree to it. You, they, they don't want to burn their bridges, they want to get exclusive looks at news, so they will agree. Treat it with caution and make sure that you state it clearly, but you can totally do this. So build in the time if it's your news. At the same time though, be clear on what's newsworthy. If you are writing about some new widget in your product, the chances are the press is not going to care about it. Almost none of the security press writes about products in detail unless you happen to be an absolutely enormous company or they're writing something negative and you really don't want to get into that stream. So be clear that like your widget release, and this is, this is something I have to tell my own product team on a regular basis. Actually, my product team is quite well trained now, so not on a regular basis. Um, but they understand that when we release uh, like, I'm not going to get coverage for it. I'm not actually going to because if I kept stuff like that, he would stop answering my emails, pretty much. <laughs> so now that you understand who your targets are and you know what kind of uh, approach you're making, it's time for you to craft the perfect fish. And at the end of the day, this is social engineering. You are trying to effectively trick the press into taking an action you want them to take. Be clear though, they're doing the same to you. Like once you hook them with your fish, the tables are going to turn. They are going to be full on trying to socially engineer you. We'll get to that later. So you're building your story. You think about how do you make it as relevant as possible? What's the real significance? So for example, when one of my researchers comes to me and says, I found these vulnerabilities in serial servers and they're terrible. I think, wow, that sounds super boring. I have no idea what you're talking about. So I tell him like, hey, give me some examples of how this can actually have an impact. And then he comes back to me and he's like, well, mm, I don't know, there's this thing that you can do with the train where you might be able to derail it. And like, I don't know, it looks like I can blow up some churches in England. Oh, okay, well that sounds quite interesting now. Why didn't you lead with that? So you need to think about, now at the same time, those examples are really spuddy. Balance the FUD. Does everyone know what FUD is? Fear and certainty doubt? Perfect. Uh, you need to balance your FUD with your so what. You always need to provide a so what, but provide a so what that's realistic. You know, realistically, HD is not going to go and blow up churches in England, I hope. I don't know why it's going against England. Uh, but he's, and he's probably not going to derail a train either. So we, we want to like talk about those in couch terms as to like why it's super hard to do that and why that's not a realis realistic attack uh, vector. But we also want to provide the examples so that when Paul is looking at and he's looking at the first two sentences of the email, he instantly gets why this is going to be interesting to his readers. The third piece, of course, is like accuracy is paramount. Accuracy, honesty, transparency. Don't try and fudge, don't try and lie, don't try and misrepresent. Be very clear on your information before you go in. Okay. So, once again, to recap, you need to have a clear idea on what your role is and what the reporter's role is and how the whole story goes together. You need to be timely and understand what the timelines are going to look like for all of this. You need to be relevant. And here's the one that's really hard. You need to avoid jargon and industry insider knowledge. Many of the reporters I showed you are people who work on security all the time and they actually have really good security knowledge. But nonetheless, they're writing for people who like to speak like human beings. If you get wrapped around the axis on specific language, you will never, ever, ever succeed in communication. Because the reality is that the key to communication is to use the language that people who you're trying to communicate with use. And, you know, I know it's a painful topic for people, but let's talk about cyber. Um, it's a perfect example of how it's really hard for people who deal with technical accuracy all day to let go of the need for specific accuracy in language. Cyber is one of those things where it kills all of us because we have a totally different mental image when we hear it to what other people are hearing 
and we just think it's kind of inane. Like, why can't people get what they're talking about? Like, it's silly. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. Because the reality is that our goal should be to let as many people know about these security issues as possible in a way that is meaningful and impactful to them. If the language they choose to use is language like cyber, if they're using the word hacker in a way you don't like, whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Get over it. It's like going to France and shouting at people in English and not understanding why they look at you like you're an idiot. Like That's basically what we do as an industry, day in, day out. We need to start speaking other people's language. And I just really want an excuse to use a Bill Murray picture. OK. So when you send your email in, uh, as Paul said, of his 400 emails a day, he deletes at least 250 of them just from looking at the subject line. That's because you're tripping his alerts. So there are certain words that will trigger alerts. I put up a selection here. Paul, <laughs> did I get some of them right? <laughs> Expert. Okay, I'll, I'll swap hard bleed out for expert. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you want to just think about, like, you know, in as much as you want to use the language that your audience, that, that his audience is going to use, you also want to avoid, and like, this is probably not something that many of you in the room, you know, marketers do. And, and I, so I can say it, they do it all the freaking time. And this kind of language layered on just is a complete anathema to reporters. It like basically creates a filter. So, okay, now we've figured out how to uh, actually get a briefing. We're going to talk about what you do when you get a briefing. Um, so there are basically two types of ways of briefing a reporter. One is verbally, and the other is in writing. So I'll start with in writing. For those of you who have not previously worked with media, starting in writing is a really good idea. It gives you the ability to get comfortable and to have that chance to read through it a couple of times and make sure that you're happy with what you said. It's harder for a comment to be used in a way that you didn't anticipate. It still can be, but it's what you wrote. And at the end of the day, it gives you that chance to edit yourself before you send it out. So this is how you um, Again, language choice to reference, although generally I just like to have an archer meme in every single slide that I do. Um, so, generally speaking, the, tr the t tricks for doing written comments are very, very simple. You want to take a stance, but the stance does not have to be controversial. You just need to have a position, and you need to go into it clear with, like, what do you want to be to the press? Like, do you want to be that guy that comes and dispels what everyone else is saying? Do you want to be the guy that talks about what the vendor did wrong? Do you want to be the guy that like really focuses on helping the the end user that's impacted understand how to protect themselves? Like, have a clear idea of who you want to be when you write this stuff. That will dictate what your stance is going to be. Do you want to be the smartest guy in the room, the most technical person? Like, if so, then your response needs to be really focused on finding what that technical nuance. Is. Um, once you've done that, you want to think about how it's going to be used. A reporter is looking for something they can literally copy and paste and drop into their article. So if you send them 2,000 words of your opinion on something, they are not going to read it. Again, they write their article in a two-hour window in the morning. They do not have time to piece it everybody that sends, it, that sends them one. So you want to think about what does a written quote in an article look like? It's normally a couple of sentences. That's what you should be providing. If you have a couple of different points you want to hit, then provide a couple of different paragraphs. But keep it manageable. At the same time, do not go the other way. <laughs> Monosyllabic is not quotable. So if you are having an email conversation even with a reporter and they ask you a question, if you provide a one-word answer, they are not going to be able to quote that. So only ever do it if you're doing it for effect. If you're doing it because you don't want to be quoted on that question, that's fine. If you're doing it, like if they ask you something and your answer is basically like, nope, that's fine, because they're not probably going to quote you on it. But if you want to see your answer quoted, you need to give them more than one word, or they're just not going to be able to use it. And then my last point is keep it authentic. And this will be like a recurring theme 
that you'll hear me talk about is authenticity is really important. You need to be you. You need to be comfortable. Otherwise, you're never going to get good at this and reporters are never really going to want to work with you because they're always going to feel like, I don't really know where I stand with this person. And they're going to feel like if they quote you, you could turn around and be like, I didn't say that. So you, you need to like really be true to yourself on this and sound like a real person. The reality is that nobody wants to read comment from people that sound like automatons. And you know, we, one of the things that I'm lucky is I, I work with some people who are incredibly sardonic and very comfortable putting that into writing. And that makes for really good comment. They sound like real people. People like to read their comment. It's like reading a register article. They like it. OK, so navigating the environment. Um, my terrible attempt at a security term for what to do when you're actually doing a media briefing. So we're going to go through some basic do's and don'ts. And I apologize. Typically, I don't really like wordy slides. But the whole goal of this is that anyone who wants the slides afterwards can take them. And there's actual learnings here. So <clears throat> my number one rule for anybody talking to press ever is be honest. If I work with a spokesperson who is intentionally dishonest, I will never let them brief media again. It is a recipe for disaster, and it's skeezy as hell. So be honest. The reality is it's way too easy for you to get caught out. And you don't want to end up in a situation where there's speculation over whether you told the truth on something. It totally derails the conversation from being a core issue. Josh and I have talked about this a lot recently. I think everyone here is probably pretty familiar with the Chris Roberts situation. Um, so, you know, there's a really important conversation here to be had about the safety of planes. And instead, everybody's talking about whether he really did what he said he did or what the FBI said he Who cares? The point is about the safety of the plane. Don't be dishonest, whether he was or not. <laughs> so, know what your core message is going into it. This is something that people forget to do, and it's really, really, really important. It's the secret to a good briefing, and it will make you feel a little bit like you're that kid in class who tried too hard, but it's actually really important. So you basically, before you do the briefing, think about the story in your head and think about what the one thing is that you want to land. Or maybe it's two things or three things. I wouldn't go above three. Three is up a highly unmanageable number as it is. So like, have your core messages. Here's the other thing. Repetition of your core messages is a good thing. If you keep banging one point over and over again, that's the point the reporter's going to walk away with. So repetition is a really good thing. And you'll actually hear me say use repetition plenty through this talk for exactly the same reason. There are basic messages that I really want to land with you guys, so I will keep using them. Did I mention be honest? Um, so know what your core messages are, and be prepared to always go back to those core messages. Um, on the language thing, so we talked a little bit, or I talked because you guys are all just sitting there. But, um, we talked a little bit about you know, the language you use and making it simple and avoiding like buzzword bingo. The best way that you can make things relatable is to use analogies. And actually, the press love analogies, particularly media that write for non-technical titles. If you're talking to somebody at the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, their audience is not security professionals. So if they can have an analogy that makes this really simple and relatable, and any that seems really visual is even better for them. They want something that's going to create that mental image for people that they go, oh, OK, I get it. You're, you're basically thinking as if you're speaking uh, effectively for my mom. And none of you know her, so that's difficult. But you just need to like, make it as relatable as possible. So analogy is good. Um, the other thing I would say is, and this is a hard one to do in the moment, but it's something that you can work on over time is to focus on positive statements. Um, <clears throat> it's very easy when you're talking about things to get into saying negative statements. And particularly, security people often will have a leaning towards that. We are breakers, after all. I say we, I mean you. Um, but the reality is that when that comes into print, and it's in a different context, it looks different to you. It will sound tonally different. If you can turn a statement around to focus on the positive and sort of create white space, you know, like a vacuum where the negative comment is. Yeah, sure.
uh, two tiny examples, and you can tell me where I got it wrong. Um, BMW had a hack in April, and a lot of our echo chamber started doing the fail whale and all sorts of like mocking them for mistakes. Um, the cavalry talked about it briefly, and we decided that we would turn this into a success story and show how their response to the security finding was embracing some of the benefits of three of our five stars in the five star automotive cyber safety framework. They worked with researchers without suing them, which was one of them. They did an over the air update before their customers even knew they were vulnerable, uh, which is another one. And in the process of doing so, they realized they were passing updates in the clear. So while we could have been one of the voices pointing a finger, by amplifying the things they did right, we also had a, a road sign for their competitors to, to maybe emulate. And the second one is um, uh, more debatable, but United uh, put out a bug bounty <coughs> and they specifically excluded the ability to test wireless systems on the plane, et cetera. So a lot of people focused on how incomplete the bug bounty was, which I think is fair, very fair. <coughs> but and um, we should be really psyched that an air, air aviation company is starting their their growth towards third party collaboration. So I'm not saying these are all victories, um, but we made deliberate choices in both of those cases to say something they're doing right instead of something they're doing wrong. Thank you. Um, okay, some more do. Um, so when you're briefing somebody, frequently these days people will record briefings. But in many cases they're also taking notes. Um, you want to pause and give people a chance to catch up. You also want to pause and give people a chance to ask questions. And it's also okay to say things like, hey, does that make sense? Um, to make sure that your message is actually landing and they're getting the key takeaways. Because Otherwise, they may seem like they're getting it, or they could have actually just completely switched off and disengaged, and you won't know it unless you're trying to like actually create some sort of conversation with them. Uh, be aware of your body language. Um, this is one of the things that I sometimes have a habit of doing is I will uh, tell people something, and then I'll do some sort of weird little shrug thing that makes it seem as if I'm like, ah, believe that if you will. Uh, just be aware of it. Um, try not to you know, undermine yourself. Uh, don't roll your eyes at people, they gener generally don't like that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, and then this is another classic is, uh, conversations often will either meander or they'll sort of rabbit hole or sometimes um, a reporter will sort of get really interested in something and go off on a tangent. Now, there's a couple of things to know here. One is that sometimes that's actually valuable, like as Paul mentioned earlier, Sometimes he has a conversation with somebody on one topic and something completely separate comes up and it gives him an idea for a piece. So this can be valuable. But in some situations, it's also an indication that the reporter isn't really what you're saying. And in that situation, like you want to know that that's the case and you want to pull it. Okay, what you do is you basically go a level up in your messaging, make it simpler, bring them back to that point. And then let them drill down into the detail. So you start high, let them go down. Okay, so some don'ts now. Um, so don't get drawn into sensationalism or speculation unless that's really what you want to do, in which case that's all you, fair enough. Um, be careful with it, it gets away from the And um, frankly, like as we try to uh, make the world a safer place, if you will. Um, feeding the speculation and sensationalism actually doesn't help our case. It does completely the opposite. It creates a crying wolf sensation and it makes people just filter anything we tell them. Uh, don't be afraid of silence. We're gonna get to this in a bit, but um, silence is a reporter's best friend. People will always try and fill the silence. Um, look at me, I've just been talking non-stop for the past 40 minutes because you guys aren't saying anything. Um, so don't, don't feel pressured to answer questions, but be aware, like, no comment is a statement in its own right. And you don't want to create that statement unless you're doing it very intentionally. So, you know, if somebody said to me, like, what's my view on a Rapid7 competitor doing X? Like, I might say no comment in a jokey way to them because, like, that is a comment in and of itself. But 
if it was like a serious thing where I had a message I wanted to land about that, then I would actually try and give them a real answer so I could get quoted in an article. Um, and the last one, <clears throat> the last one is don't go off the record. So generally speaking, like I go off the record all the time, but I also know the press really well. So you have to get to a point where you are comfortable and you know that you can count on a relationship with a reporter. So I'll tell you, the first time I ever did this training at a security conference, I had um, Steve Reagan with me and, and Paul came to the session, which I thought was hilarious because he obviously doesn't need media training. Um, and he just basically came to check out what tricks I was teaching people. But yeah, so, um, <laughs> so we got to the don't go off the record thing and we were having a debate about whether, um, whether journalists will actually screw you on this. And both Steve and Paul just looked at each other and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, if the story's good enough and the opportunity's good enough, totally. So you just really need to get to a point where you know that the relationship you have with them is more valuable to them than that one story. And then you can apply it off the record. But until then, no way. Don't, don't share anything off the record. Um, okay, <clears throat> lateral movement. So, Basically, this is um, a particular technique where you get asked something and it's a question you don't want to answer. And there are two things that you can do about this. Um, one is bridging, and the other is where you actually do answer the question, but you just answer it in a totally different way. This is what I was talking about earlier when I said about being positive rather than negative. So, has anybody ever done the um, the game where you have to say yes and after things. It's really hard to do, it's an improv game. Um, so this is a, a good habit to get into, is to try and say and, not but. It totally, cho totally changes the position of what you're saying. You can make the same point, but you want to lead in in a positive way. It makes your statement seem much stronger and, and your point of view way less defensive or evasive. There are other ways that you can take a question you don't want and you can still answer it without like completely derailing the conversation or getting backed into a corner. So I've included a couple here that I'm not going to go through. Bridging. Bridging is basically a technique whereby you get, you get, um, you get asked a question you don't want to answer. And remember we talked earlier on about your core messages, the key points that you want to land. So when you get asked that question that you don't want to answer, rather than being evasive or giving a half answer, you basically are going to answer the question in a way that walks the report to the make. So a bridging thing is where somebody asks you a question and you lead in with an answer that addresses that question and then you pivot that point that you're making smoothly into another point that pulls you back to the core message that you had. Uh, and, and people who talk to the press all the time use bridging a lot. Josh is like a broken record, he uses bridging all the time. <laughs> okay, so um, avoiding countermeasures, and honestly, I just wanted to use a picture of this creepy guy, and I'm gonna ask Paul to come back up now, not that this is a picture of Paul. <clears throat> so, countermeasures. These are the tricks the reporters use. And there's a bunch of them, these are not you know, the only ones they use, um, but these are some of the things that reporters might use to try to get you to say things that they find really usable. So um, I'm going to basically ask Paul to give some examples of each of them. OK. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, there's a very big social engineering component to being a good reporter. Um, and at the end of the day, <clears throat> anything that's going to make a good story is probably not information that people want. Um, out there and in print, so um, you do need to find a way to extract that from people who are sources or either knowing or unknowing. Um, and yeah, I mean, ambushing, I think, is probably one of the more common um, techniques, and that's basically what the name suggests: is you're getting somebody when they're unawares. That could be, you know, when they're out drinking at a social event or at a bar uh, and are have their guard down. That's very reliable way to get interesting information um, and I think use it pretty I mean it's it's hard in in online journalism which which most people are doing these days because a lot of the work you're doing via email or um, uh, you know social media of some sort 
um, and so it, it gets harder. But certainly in environments such as Source Conference, when everybody gets together, goes out socializing, that, that it really works well. I was telling Paul earlier that uh, this was very, very recently used on me. Um, I was at a party in DC and a reporter came up to me and <laughs> completely ambushed me. <laughs> and, and there was literally a look on my face of like, oh God, I've been drinking. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and it was hilarious because my, my body language was so readable that my CEO and Space Rogue both kind of like formed a shield around me. It was amazing. <laughs> So um, yeah, ambushing happens all the time. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, and and it's just you know human to human contact and, and looking somebody in the face and asking them a, a question point blank, you're a lot more likely to get information out of them than an email that you throw over the transom or even a phone conversation. Silence, as Jen said, is a really uh, good technique. I must say, as a reporter, I'm not always as good as it as as I should, or I don't use it as effectively as I should. But it's basically sitting down to do an interview with somebody, uh, a either a pointed interview or a kind of general briefing and just not saying much and let them fill the space with words. And, and while you might just get a bunch of words, uh, you might also get some um, you know, information divulged that you can then sort of pick at the thread and say, oh, hmm, that's interesting, say a little bit more about that or you know, kind of get them to pursue a topic that maybe wasn't on the agenda of their PR handler, but <laughs> is on your agenda. Um, so, but it's, it's sort of a, you know, you're kind of throwing your, throwing your lot in with chance and, and um, maybe something good comes out of it. Uh, machine gunning, yep. So wait, uh, what I think I'll do is like, as you go through them, I'll just talk about some things you can do to, to avoid them. Go for it. So with ambushing, if you get ambushed, uh, the best thing to do is to just keep the conversation really shallow. And if they start trying to lead you into conversations that you don't want to have, like asking about the thing that you don't want to talk about, then you should just basically be like, I would be really happy to schedule some time to talk about this. Um, let's like set up a call. Or why don't you email me some questions? And that way you're not like telling them, hey, I won't talk about it, I won't address it. You're just making it very clear you're drawing a line, a boundary of like social interaction versus work interaction. And ambushes can be phone calls as well. You know, you get called out of the blue by a reporter who's like, oh, I'm on deadline, I need a quote, or I want to ask you about this, and I heard this. And you feel a lot of pressure to have a conversation with this person. You, you know, you can, I don't know, yeah. schmuck for saying this, but I mean, you know, you can just sort of say, mm, you know, it's not a good time for me, can I call you back even yeah. in 15 minutes, you right. know, and then just make a few calls yourself, send an email out, be like, what should we say, what shouldn't we say? And I do that all the time. Yeah. With silence, um, so I think that the best way of dealing with silence is just to play it back to the reporter. Uh, <laughs> when they go quiet, you go quiet. It works a dream. And I've fallen for silence um, before, like I've had it used on me very effectively, and it is a horrible thing to do to let that silence stretch. But you have to get to a point where you're comfortable with it. You just have to like know what it is, recognize it, be like, okay, this is it, this is it. Just stay quiet. And if it gets to a point where you basically feel like you're playing chicken and you can't bear it anymore, then you can just say, and they'll move on. And even if they say, oh, no, I think that's about it, or they repeat their last question, you can be like, well, I think we've covered it. And you can just say, OK, thank you. Yep. Machine gunning, as the name suggests, asking a whole bunch of questions in a real rapid fire. Um, manner, kind of get them punchy a little bit from having to, you know, switch in so many different directions all at once. Often the, you know, real question is somewhere in the middle of that machine gun barrage um, and the other ones are just sort of um, flack, really, um, yeah. uh, thrown up there to make them not realize that they gave you some information that you really want. Frequently what happens is when people get machine guns, they will answer the one question they least wanted to answer. Because that's the one that hits their anxiety and the, the one that they were like most stressed about. And so that, that's why it's such an effective technique. Um, if you get machine gunning, again, silence is a great tool. You can use it to your heart's content. So if I get machine gunning, I stop talking. And then like, once they've stopped talking, I say, okay, would you like to answer questions in the time? Where should I start? Um, like, 
it can be a little bit of a game of who's, who's got control, and you don't want to do it in a way where you seem like a douchebag, right? You don't want to seem like you're being like aggressive or whatever. But at the same time, you also need to like not feel pressured to, to like have your back to the wall and just give them whatever information they want. It's not an interrogation, or at least it shouldn't be. Um, <laughs> posing as your best friend. <laughs> I mean, what do we really need to say about posing as your best friend? I mean, I, uh, yeah, uh, you know, again, the good reporters are good social engineers, and to the extent that they can, <laughs> I know, Josh, I'm afraid to, I'm afraid to tell you, but it's all just a, it's an illusion. <laughs> um, you know, uh, what can I say about this? I mean, some people are, some people will sort of suck up and yeah. and use that, and if you're sort of have a fragile ego and are susceptible to that type of flattery, um, then that can work. I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because if you even have a, a modest sort of social radar, then you'll immediately see that for what it is and, and it will uh, you know turn you off as it should. Um, I think in the security industry a lot, uh, it's a s still a fairly small community and a lot of stuff comes down to relationships and yeah. reputation and so it's I think it's harder to just um, do that, but you know, it's also a bunch of guys. If you're, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, there are many different ways to to social engineer people. So I think I think this one is a little tough for people because it is a small community and relationships are key for media. Like you actually want to build a great relationship, and often what happens is people get together at security conferences and there's a lot of drinking, a lot of hanging out, and you know. Frequently what happens is that uh, people think that they're really good friends with the reporters and I see this all the time. Like I'll, I'll often be with the reporters and so I'll see people come over and I see the nature of the interactions. And it's really easy when a reporter is friendly to you to get into a situation where you want to please. And you want to keep that friendliness going. You want to be their friend. So you, it's not even that they're necessarily trying to trick you, it's that like naturally want to please and so you kind of overcompensate the best thing to do is just be really wary i mean just you know not in a like i can't trust anyone kind of a way i'm not trying to make any of you paranoid um you're security people i don't need to make you paranoid um but just be aware of it and be aware of the fact that you know the nature of relationships and conferences is that they are fairly surface level well put <laughs> um yeah, uh, interrupting and paraphrasing both kind of um, uh, pretty common techniques in an interview. Uh, trying to, you know, you have your spiel. I mean, this is really common with like, you know, corporate related briefings where you have your spiel, you have your talking points. And any good reporter worth his or her salt is going to try really quickly to get you off your talking points. Like, well, first I'm going to tell you about, and it's like, no. Let's talk about this. You know, either I just read this and it happened, and I want your insight on it, or what about this thing that you know you were talking about six months ago, and you know, or here's here's what I'm after from you, um, and that you know, um, you both need to I think play with that a little bit. Yeah. You can't be like I am just going to stick to my talking <laughs> points and I don't care what you say. So you need to respond to that, but also as Jen said, try and bring it back around to what it is yeah. that you're there to talk about. I have a really great example of paraphrasing. Um, so um, when the Home Depot breach ha happened, um, we had a reporter reach out to us and um, they wanted to speak to one of our pen testers who used to work at Home Depot. And I kind of looked at this and I was like, I think I see what's happening here. So I, uh, I basically said, you know, we have this other pen tester who'd be able to teach you about pen testing because that's what the reporter said that they wanted to talk about was pen testing. So we, we scheduled this call with this, this other guy and um, the reporter asked how many times a year um, he would recommend organizations pen test. And he gave an answer and, and it was, there were more yeah, would you recommend every organization pen test? But he gave an answer and so the reporter then paraphrased, turned it around and said, so you're saying that Home Depot didn't pen test enough? And um, he was basically like, 
No, I'm not. <laughs> I didn't say that at all. I didn't mention Home Depot. And so you just have to be really careful on how if a reporter has an agenda, they have a specific quote they want to get into an article, and this does really happen, that they're not going to walk you, like in the same way that you're walking them to the points you want to make, that they aren't at the same time trying to walk you to the points they want you to make so they can get that quote and put it in their article. And if they do try and do that, you have to like be able to keep calm, keep it together, be polite, but just very firmly say, nope, that's not what I'm saying, and then clarify. Yeah. I mean, I've seen reporters do that. I, I hate it. I think it's yeah. really skeevy, it's and it's really just sort of like, one. listen, you're trying to, what? Hey. <laughs> 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 I don't do it. I mean, I really don't think I do. I mean, you know, uh, you know, d d trying to sort of mash words for that, you know, for taking somebody something, something somebody said and either wrapping some different context around it or rearranging the, the, what they said to fit some particular need that you have in your story. Um, yeah, yeah, it is really, really common. It's done all the time. You do need to be cognizant, I think, when you're doing an interview that your words may be twisted and just make very clear you know what what it is that you're talking about and what you're not talking about but I'm not a big fan of the technique despite what <laughs> Mr. Corman might say um, dart throwing um, you get kind of I mean I think by that you just mean kind of um, just taking a shot at the dart in the dark at some particular so dart, dart throwing is when they launch a controversial statement at you to see mm -hmm. how you'll react mm -hmm. I get this all the time I get metasploits evil I get that all the time uh, Metasploit is used by criminals for enabling the bad guys. And people will say it to me, or to one of our spokespeople, to see what, what they can get back, what reaction they can get. In situations like that, again, you have to stay calm, you have to recognize it for what it is, and if you went into that conversation with what your core messages were, and you knew what they were and you had them, Chris, then in that situation, you can respond because you've got that, that safety and security of knowing your core message. So like when somebody says that to me, I know how to respond to that because I'm pretty familiar with what Metasploit is and how to tell the story about it. So I can be like, well, actually, this is the logic behind it. And it doesn't, it doesn't throw me. So just be really crisp on what your core messages are going into it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much. You're welcome. So the freebie. Are we gonna talk about Chris Roberts too? Because I think that's kind of a, it's like a, like an object lesson and yeah do you want to sure we can talk about that do you want to yeah. do that now do you yeah, do sure. it then? so I mean I think the Chris Roberts um, case that, that came up with with the uh, hacking the um, avionics systems or maybe he didn't or maybe he did uh, is a really good object lesson for um, what you all as security researchers or people who are working within security organizations um, should uh, be aware of. I think you should look at that probably as a negative uh, example of what you should do. And I, I must say, I was talking to Chris Roberts at the time. I actually have a great text message from him saying, "Can you talk now?" And he said, nope, in F custody. Um, so I was w talking with him regarding another story, somewhat related story. Um, uh, at the time, uh, he was arrested in Syracuse, and, and an interview with him shortly after he got out of jail. Um, sorry, out of FBI custody, um, and um, wrote about it for Security Ledger, or wrote about it for Passcode. Uh, so I think Chris is a really uh, gifted uh, engineer and uh, security uh, expert, and he, I, I don't know that I would recommend that particular course of action in, in the future um, both on the social media side, given the context of what he was writing on, and just, I think when you're dealing with media, you do need to be aware that, um, and in his case, it would be way before he was talking to me, he was doing stuff with um, uh, Fox News, uh, Greta Sundstrom, um, uh, and others. And, um, y you know, uh, I think w in the context that we're talking about now, where the, these are matters of life and limb, where these are matters of federal law um, uh, being broken and, and real potentially criminal actions, uh, you do need to be very cognizant of the fact that 
just because you gave a presentation on it at a security conference doesn't absolve you of any liability or uh, doesn't mean that uh, the police or, or, or authorities are not going to take an interest in what you're doing. Um, and so that's, that's I think, a, a, an object lesson for having a game plan as to, okay, well, we've got this information, we've done this research, um, both what are our legal exposures around this um, to the extent that we want to um, circulate this in the community outside of the immediate companies affected, Airbus and Boeing and maybe the FAA. How do we want to do that? We want to do this in a way that we're in control of the message um, and we're in control of the talking points. Um, just kind of going on air at a major national news outlet and saying, oh yeah, I have hack planes all the time and I can do this and I can do that. Um, or at a conference, getting up on a conference stage and saying it. Um, it might not get noticed, and in fact, much of his stuff didn't get noticed for many years, um, but it might, and if it does, you can find yourself in a, in a, world, of, in a world of hurt. Um, so I think it, it all kind of speaks to what Jen's saying, which is it's, it's not 1999 anymore. It's no longer, you know, you can get up and scream from the tallest tree and no one's going to hear you. People are listening. People are paying very close attention to um, the work that independent security researchers are doing um, and what they're saying, whether it's on a blog or uh, on the you know, nightly news. Um, and there are real, real repercussions um, for some of this stuff. So you, you need to be cognizant of that. That's an excellent point. Right. There's, there's a sort of weird phenomenon that I'm sure most of you have familiar with where um, for some reason people completely lose all their common sense as soon as they engage in Twitter and um, that's that's a bad thing to do um, uh, I, I would be wary of disproportionate reactions on Twitter um, I would uh, be wary of um, bold statements that can be taken out of context um, and it's funny like you see stories about communications professionals like people in my role who fall into this trap all the time. Like, it's, it's like a weird sort of twilight zone um, because you're there and you're talking to your pals and there's all this banter and you kind of forget that it's actually one-to-many communication, not one-to-one -one communication. And that your incredibly limited uh, length of communication, your 140 characters, and like there's no possible way to get context into 140 characters. So you kind of, it's, it's easy to forget that that context that you haven't provided will be provided in the minds of other people who read it who won't necessarily know you. And so like, be very wary of how you use social media and try and be smart about it and, and try and remember to have some, um, some common sense and, and like, just really proportionate response is important. Um, and we don't necessarily always see a lot of that. Um, and media is a completely different trap. When you start to do media and you start to like, get yourself quoted in things and you get comfortable doing it, like at the beginning, you're uncomfortable, you worry about it, you're nervous, and so you like, put in the time and effort, you really think about it. Once you start to do it for a while, you forget that like, it's a process and that this stuff is gonna live in print for a really long time. The internet has a long memory. And so, I see people all the time, like I, I mentioned earlier on that I had fallen victim to silence. I have done media training for years and yet the day that a, a, a reporter from one of the major nationals called me and used silence on me, I fell for it because I didn't like reinforce to myself the messages. I fell into that trap of being a little bit too confident of my own skills. And you need to reinforce this stuff with yourself all the time. You need to make sure that you don't get to the point where you're like, I know my messages, I don't need to think about this going in. Because what will happen is it will create a bad briefing. And when the article comes out, you either won't be in it or you won't like what's in it. So you have to keep investing in this stuff. Media training is not a point in time thing. The, the spokespeople I work with are some of, I think, some of the best spokespeople in the industry. But every single time they do a briefing, they get their ass kicked by me because I will always give them feedback on it. And I don't mean that they get their ass kicked by me. I actually don't give them credit, that harsh criticism. But like, I'll always be like, hey, just watch out for this thing because it's a constant reminder. And I need it too. I ask for it when I talk to the press. I, I ask afterwards. <clears throat> so 
for the freebie. Um, it's not cars, I'm sorry. But um, basically, at the end of an interview, your average reporter will say to you, um, is there anything you'd like to add? Or is there anything I missed? Um, and we call this the freebie. This is your prime opportunity to restate your core message. So do not go, ah, I think I kind of covered it all. We're good. That's a wasted opportunity. Do not do that. What you want to do is say, um, yeah, as discussed, I just, you know, I want to reinforce and you can restate those core messages. That means that the last point that they got in your briefing was that core message. That was the last note you left it on. That is a strong, positive thing to do. So do not walk away from the freebie. The freebie is good. And obviously, if there's something you didn't cover that you wanted to get to, then use that. So, you have now, <coughs> um, hopefully, briefed the press relatively successfully. So how do you escalate your privileges? Um, relationships are key. We talked about this a bunch, about you know knowing what a real relationship is and how to get to that point. Um, wow, it's a life lesson. Um, I think the best ways to do this are to make sure that you keep delivering value. You know, as I said earlier, I'm very careful about the things that I send to press. I don't go to Paul with um, widget announcements because he's not going to want to read my emails if I do. So you have to try and keep the quality going of what you're offering. Make sure that you continue to be relevant. Make sure that you're responsive and reliable when they come to you and ask for something. That's really important. Understand that they're on a timeline. And yes, you have a full-time job and it's not this, but they're on a timeline. And if you want to be included in their piece, like they're giving you the opportunity to do that. That's a great thing. You have to respond to that by either getting them what they need quickly or at least being responsive enough to say, hey, I'm really sorry, I can't make this work. And then they know they can move on to somebody else. So be reliable. Um, don't expect to see the copy or approve it before it goes out. If you ask, most reporters are going to laugh at you. Um, if you're very lucky and there's something really nuanced that you gave them, they might send that tiny bit of it to you to make sure they got it right. But generally speaking, you should never expect to see this before it goes to print. That's just not how the relationship works. Reporters have to main their, maintain their independence. Um, and the other thing is, if you said you would follow up, then do. Frequently, if you get a question you don't want to answer, rather than like being evasive or giving an answer that you're not sure is accurate, what you'll say is, I'll look into that and come back to you. And that is a really great answer. Like, reporters don't have a problem with that. You can totally do that anytime. But if you say you're going to do that, make sure you actually do it. Be reliable. OK, so now you've done all of that, how do you get away clean? Um, <clears throat> so the first thing is, again, just to reinforce, as I said, there'd be a lot of repetition. Uh, don't expect to see your copy. It's not going to happen and follow up if you said you would. Uh, apparently I didn't read my slides. Um, <laughs> when you um, see the article come out, share it. You know, a, a reporter is trying to build their brand just as you are. And so when the article comes out, share it through social no networks and reference the reporter. Generally speaking, that's a winner. Um, look at who covered your comment, who, t who, who used your stuff. And so like if you've gone to a bunch of different people, look at who was interested. Learn from it. Look at what was used. So if you did a briefing with Paul and he used like one thing that you said and nothing else, try and like understand why that was the case. Look at the context of the article. You can even follow up and say, I wouldn't advise you do it all the time, but like in specific cases, you can always like have a conversation and say like, just out of interest, was this, you know, too technical or whatever. Um, and maintain a positive tone, stay professional. Even if you see something that you don't like, you should not take the approach of throwing the, the reporter under the bus, um, and which we're going to talk about a little bit more. So if you are going to engage with press, you need to walk into it with your eyes open, knowing that at some point, you are going to see yourself quoted in a way you do not like. This is part of the business. You need to accept that. You can do things to minimize your risk, but ultimately, it's a complex relationship and they're writing up an article and you're going to see something in a context that you didn't anticipate and you're probably going to be unhappy about it. In that situation, being graceful is very important. If what they've used is factually inaccurate, follow up with them and let them know. Reporters want to be accurate. They don't want to be a bunch of, you know, fly-by-night cowboys. So if you follow up and you say, hey, just so you know, like X, 
they're gonna go and change it and they're gonna be grateful that you let them know, particularly if you let them know in a way that is friendly and helpful rather than aggressive and adversarial. Um, but if it's not an inaccuracy, if it's just that your stuff's been used in a way you don't like, fuck it up. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so that was a huge amount of information. So just a very quick recap on my top five tips for hacking the media. Um, do your research, know what you're getting into. Um, make sure that your position and message is before you engage. Be friendly and courteous uh, before, during, and after. Be honest. Did I mention be honest? Um, and don't go off the record until I tell you you can. Questions and questions for Paul as well. Go ahead. Do any of these rules change for press outside of the US that you've been exposed to? Um, not generally. Um, so not in as much as, again, you're going to do your research and you're going to know uh, what the press is like. In certain countries, press are more interested in certain things. So. As a general rule of thumb, German press is more technical. They like technical detail. Um, as a general rule of thumb, press in countries like um, Spain and France are really, really interested in having angles that specifically re relate to that country. They want customers from that country. They, they want to talk about companies involved in that country. Um, as a general rule of thumb, UK press are a little bit less formal um, and sarcastic. Um, uh, so yeah, that, like again, if you do your research and you know who the press are that you're talking to and what they're interested in, and you've looked at like the way they cover things, then all the other rules apply. Any other questions? Oh yeah, I can't believe that wasn't in here. <sighs> who wrote this media training? <laughs> Um, okay, so Josh just asked what the difference is between um, on background, off the record, and on the record. Okay, on the record, very straightforward, it means that you're going to get quoted, um, potentially, if you've done a good job, and, um, and it will be attributed to you. Um, off the record means it won't end up in print at all. On background means the reporter can use the content, but they can't attribute it to you. So that would be... Uh you know, source familiar with the incident, uh, source with knowledge of the, uh, you know, company, that type of stuff. Uh, so when Bloomberg wrote the piece about um, Kaspersky being in bed with uh, whatever the KGB is called today, um, there were lots of people who were very upset because all of the sources were unnamed. So all of the people who spoke to Bloomberg about that spoke to them on background. Basically, it is basically channel master rule here. Yeah. And let's use, I mean, uh, on background is used uh, often these days. Um, you know, I think generally when you're sourcing people, I think the most of the time now people want to know why they're being sourced and why they're anonymous. So, you know, who asked not to be named because he or she didn't have permission from his employer to speak or because, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a frequent one, or because they were worried about uh, repercussions, yep. you know, uh, professional repercussions or something like that. So it's, if you're just sourcing somebody and it's not clear why they're sourced, I guess that's, that, that can be problematic. Yep. Um, and I, I would say in general you want to um, make the ground rules clear before you tell them anything. So I have people who I'm interviewing all the time who will tell me be verbose and then as an uh, addendum say, oh yeah, this is all off the record or uh, of course this is off the record or, or you know, this is only on background, you know. And it's like, well, no, I didn't know that and you just told it to me on the record. So as far as I'm concerned, it's on the record. Yeah. Often if I have a relationship with you or if it's not that important to me anyway, <laughs> uh, more often the case, then, then you'll say, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, but just know that they're under no obligation to do that if you've told them stuff without specifying that you're that you don't want it used in a story or that you don't want it attributed to you uh, unless you specify that up front then you know you're, you're kind of out of luck 
Yeah, so to Paul's point, um, two things I would say on that is one, um, when you state it at the beginning of what you're saying, make sure that they agree. Like it's not just enough for you to say, this is off the record, and them to just stay quiet. They have to acknowledge that. And I will be like very pedantic about making sure I get that acknowledgement, even if it's with a reporter that I'm really good friends with. Um, by which I mean a reporter posing as my friend. Um, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the second thing I would say is, again, this goes back to what I was saying before about, you know, you're never off the record until like you really know you can be off the record. The same thing applies to on background. Like just be very, very cautious with it um, because it is a good halfway measure and, and a lot of reporters will respect it. But at the same time, there is always a backlash when reporters use unnamed sources, so they would much rather have a name to go with the source. And again, if you don't have that relationship, just be very wary about offering that. Particularly as the challenge is, people get a little, a little loose tongued as soon as they like have that agreement. Like as soon as they hear the words on background, they're like, "Well then, let me tell you what I really think." And even if that's not going to end up in print you are creating an impression with that reporter that you just may not want to create. Like, you want to make sure that they still consider you to be a credible, valuable, professional resource. Okay, any other questions? Oh, sorry, did you have to that? I mean, I would just say in general, if you all are working for security companies, if you're doing research, um, product research, one thing I've noticed is that often um, companies now are are using their blogs to um, to air research that they've done. Could be research on a third party product. Um, most of them do a pretty good job of it, but I, I am continually surprised by how kind of half-assed a lot of companies are about that. So they'll complete the research, wrap it up, and publish it on their blog the next day. And yeah. so when they're talking to the press, they're like, "Oh, have you talked to?" you know, GE or the company whose product this is, oh yeah, no, we haven't done that, or oh, we sent them an email, we haven't heard back, and it's just sort of like, you know, this, these are pretty serious accusations, or these are pretty serious information that you're imparting to me, a member of the press. The fact that you haven't taken the steps to contact the company and work with them through, you know, uh, to, to redress these. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it affects the, it, it doesn't make your, your research any more or less true, but it makes you look a little publicity seeking as opposed to what I think you would probably want to be perceived as, which is a company that's trying to do you know, a, a good, good service. So. Yeah, so when we do research, we, um, we have a standard FAQ that the researchers fill in that basically is like, um, who's affected, how bad is it, um, you know, what are the systems uh, involved, and one of the things that I really push the guys to, to think about, because I think if you're a researcher, and most researchers I know are, are sort of um, characterized in this way, the thing that drives you is you sort of have a curiosity about it. And once you've scratched that itch and satisfied that curiosity, typically the researchers I work with are ready to just move on to the next thing. So the piece at the end where they have to write it up and go through the disclosure is like, for most researchers I work with, extremely painful. That's the bit where they're just like, oh, it's such a pain. Can't you just do it? Um, and so like having people like, like hold their horses and be willing to go through, OK, well, we need to build in a, a window to, um, to talk to press. And um, we need to get a blog that like, answers all these different questions. It's painful. And if you work through coordinated disclosure like we do, we have a very standard policy where we do coordinated disclosure through Cert CC, and we do a 60-day window. So that means that in most cases, the researchers not only conducted the research 60 days before, like they've had two months of basically being like, I don't care, it's over, it's done. And in that time, I'm like, hey, you had two months to write me a blog post. But their view is, yeah, but I, I mean, it's not two months ago. Um, so you have to, like, if you're interested in getting the word out and you really do want to help people be safer, then you have to like put the time in. You have to be able to stay engaged to do that. And you have to help people get safer. So like the two questions that are always in there are what's the impact, and that goes back to the thing I said at the beginning about blowing up churches, um, which makes me sound like a psycho. Uh, and the second thing is how do people protect themselves? Nine times out of 10, when I see research come out from people, the first draft does not include anything about what people can do to protect themselves. And the reality is that even if you don't even know what they can do, like put something in there about it, like at least make an effort. 
Because if, if what we're doing here is actually trying to help people be more secure, then we have to think about that piece. <laughs> what does that actually mean? Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Yeah, whenever you speak publicly, you should just assume there are reporters in the room. Um, and, you know, as I said, the first time I gave this media training, he was in the room. So even when you're doing something that you really don't think a reporter is going to be interested in, there's a reporter in the room. 